but also likes to kayak and stuff. Um, so I was asked to talk about the Baraboo River, and that really um, forced me to think about um, the river in total instead of just our little stretch. And so I took the bike trail from Laval all the way up to Kendall, and um, you'll see that later on. But so I was showing them pictures of who we are as the Sauk County Historical Society. I got to, I left this picture in tonight because really buildings like this were a result of going back to the river, why Baraboo is here at all, and the uh, wealth that was built uh, in this area, initially with the dams and mills and then augmented by uh, the railroad. And of course we're in this building tonight, which also had a, a large tie to the river being the last remaining piece of the island woolen mill, which we'll see a little bit uh, later. So we want to talk about the uh, Baraboo River. It is the fourth largest tributary to the Wisconsin River. And the Baraboo uh, River starts along Missouri Avenue off of Highway 71 northwest of Kendall in Monroe County and empties, of course, into the Wisconsin River below Portage, flowing through four different counties. Uh, the Baraboo River watershed covers uh, 420,000 acres. Uh, it's reported to be 120 miles in length. It's really hard to get anybody to tell you how long the Baraboo River is with any consistency. Part of that is because it's so, excuse the French, damn curvy. <laughs> this, is, this is just one half mile stretch land-wise between uh, Reedsburg and North Freedom, and there are 34 bends in the river in this uh, stretch right here, just covering half a mile as the crow flies. So uh, it's hard to tell how long the river truly is. So 10 different communities uh, exist and uh, so were founded along the Baraboo River, um, from Baraboo being the largest all the way up to uh, Union Center, which is the smallest, and everything in between. Usually uh, the smaller ones are less than a thousand, and there's uh, three actually two that are 10,000 or more, Reedsburg and Baraboo. So the river drops uh, 400 feet from its start all the way to the mouth at the Wisconsin River, and it drops 40 feet uh, in the Baraboo, right in this Baraboo stretch alone. So uh, quite a significant drop in this area, which of course led to settlement. Of course, it goes through the uh, quartzite canoe, um, the Baraboo Bluffs here, the canoe-shaped uh, quartzite hills entering at the uh, Upper Narrows and exiting through uh, Devil's Lake Gap. Uh, the majority of the river, of course, uh, runs through Sauk County from northwest uh, corner through to uh, uh, exiting into Columbia County. And, of course, um, other features there, the Devil's Lake Gap and uh, the Wisconsin River, which of course, creates the outline of Sauk County. So people have been living um, on or near the Baraboo River for thousands of years. Uh, this, of course, is the natural bridge at the state park. And uh, while some distance from uh, Baraboo or in the river, of course, uh, people that lived here would have come to the Baraboo River and um, done fishing here and whatnot. Uh, the Radatz Rock Shelter, which is actually underneath the natural bridge, is uh, one of the oldest uh, known places of human habitation in the upper Midwest. In 1957, uh, excavations there found evidence of human use over a long period of time. The remains of 50 vertebrae and 15 mollusk species were identified, including the remains of passenger pigeon, turkey, elk, wolf, bobcat, fisher, marten, and mountain lion. The oldest artifacts were pieces of charred wood, presumably from fire pits which were dated to between 9,000 and 8,000 BC. This would make it the oldest documented site of human habitation in the upper Midwest. Uh, these early inhabitants, of course, were called, uh, we call them Paleo-Indians. Uh, there are also artifacts such as antler scrapers dating back to six to 7,000 years ago and evidence indicates that the shelter was used only periodically at first, perhaps as hunting or seasonal camp, but was later inhabited year-round. So people have been in the area for thousands of years. Another uh, evidence of some prehistoric life, uh, a woolly mammoth skeleton was dug up along the Baraboo River at Oak Street uh, in 1845. It was found eight feet underground. It was a 36-foot-long complete skeleton. 
and unfortunately for us, once it was brought to the surface, it started to crumble as it met the air and turned to dust. So all we have is the story about it. Now if we fast forward about 10,000 years, we come to more evidence of human habitation. Of course, the mounds that are in the area. There were once 15,000 mounds in Wisconsin, estimated uh, between 1,000 and 1,500 mounds in Sauk County alone. Uh, those being the three types, conical, linear, and effigy. This is a map of only the effigy mounds, so the, the mounds that looked like an animal or some other uh, being. So you can see the dispersion there, obviously centered on water, a very large concentration, of course, uh, in the Baraboo area. Mr. Canfield uh, left us a great map, uh, not that one, this one, in 1872 of the city of Baraboo. Uh, up in, if you can just barely read it up here, Baraboo and its surroundings, ancient mound city. And um, he, fortunately for us, uh, drew many of the mounds that were in uh, the Baraboo area. Unfortunately, all of these are gone, but especially down at the lower Oxbow, Circus World is over here, uh, we have over 100 mounds right in the um, lower Oxbow area there. And of course, that's why Mound Street is called Mound Street down there. Of course, the most famous mound in the area, the Man Mound, um, not that far from the Baraboo River, if you think about where it's uh, situated. And um, now a National Historic Landmark is the only man-shaped mound left on planet Earth. Over 90% of uh, mounds have been destroyed. And the last picture there of Man Mound Park. Uh, also up by Laval, there was another Man Mound very close to the Baraboo River. There's the river. Here it says Ancient Mounds. There's a small cluster there. And that one was destroyed, but Canfield uh, drew it before it was destroyed. That was the one on the left here. And it had its arms outstretched, maybe uh, dancing. But just like the Greenfield Man Mound had a horned headdress, and also feet. Other man mound were just kind of stick figures without hands or feet like the two here in Sauk County. So of course the mounds were destroyed by later cultures. One early Honey Creek farmer noted, we were rather irked by the large number of Indian mounds we had to plow down. There must have been at least 25 on our land. Some were shaped like animals and some like birds, and all were from three to five feet high. I suppose we should not have destroyed them, but they were then regarded merely as obstacles to cultivation and everybody plowed them down. So after the mound culture, later between 1000 and 1500 uh, CE, the Mississippian and Oni Oda cultures built substantial settlements, including the fortified village at Aztalan in southeast Wisconsin, and the Oneota may be the ancestors of the modern-day Iowa and Ho-Chunk Indian tribes who shared the Wisconsin region with the Menominee at the time of European contact. Other Native American groups living in Wisconsin when Europeans first settled included the Ojibwe, Sauk, Fox, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi who migrated to the east migrated to Wisconsin from the east between 1500 and 1700. So this map is from 1640 and if we zoom in on where Wisconsin eventually will be discovered we can see there's not much known about our area yet. This is actually not Michigan, this is uh, up north in Canada, uh, the Hudson Bay, so we're somewhere in here but nobody knows it yet. Um, so eventually John Nicolay arrives in 1634, uh, apparently the first European to visit what became Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, he was a French explorer, he was born in 1598 in France, immigrated to Quebec in 1618 as a clerk to train as an interpreter with Native Americans. He canoed west from Georgian Bay through the Great Lakes in 1634 and it is traditionally assumed that he came ashore near Green Bay at Red Banks. And we do know that he was indeed wearing a, a Chinese multicolored uh, coat and did fire some pistols off to impress the natives. So just about, uh, but we're not sure that he uh, got very far down the Fox River. 
Just about uh, 40 years later, in 1673, Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet became the first to record a journey on the Fox, Wisconsin waterway all the way to the Mississippi River near Prairie du Chien. So Marquette drew this map when he returned from his 1673 journey with Joliet, and it is the first European map of the Mississippi Valley and the first to show our area in any detail. Uh, no Baraboo River yet, but we do see this bend in the Wisconsin River that is that part of Columbia County that should be part of Sauk County, but it's not. <laughs> um, so that's the, first, that's the first time we see that. <clears throat> So after Marquette and Joliet discovered that there was a waterway connection from the Great Lakes all the way to New Orleans, then of course it opened up the area to the fur trade with the French being the first in line to control that enterprise. So the first export from Sauk County and, and the whole Baraboo River Valley was fur, uh, especially beaver fur, also otter fox and other pelts worth millions of dollars uh, in today's money were sent to Europe uh, from this area. We don't know a lot about specific fur traders who were in this area, but we do know about one that was extremely important, and of course that was Francois Barabeau, <laughs> also known as Mark Tully. <laughs> we don't have a picture of Francois, so Mark has to do it, and this was used with permission. Um, so Francois Barabeau was born November 4th, 1698, and I think we should have a Francois Barabeau Day declared uh, at the new city hall. That should be your first resolution. I will, and that should be the first thing passed in the new city hall. So he was born in, uh, he was born in La Vie, which is across uh, the St. Lawrence from Quebec, uh, which was the first French colony in 1608. Uh, he was married twice, had at least two children, and it's amazing we know anything about him at all, but Mark Tully is the one to be thanked for digging into uh, archives and finding this out. Um, so here's a 1737 map of the area showing uh, Michilimackinac and the portage. So Michilimackinac was a French uh, fort up here, the upper peninsula of Michigan out on an island. And of course, uh, once Marquette and Joliet had come, they discovered this route and of course the Grand Portage here. Um, so this would have been a map that would have been uh, familiar to um, a map like this would have been familiar to Francois Barabeau. By 1747, Barbeau was living at a French outpost, Michilimackinac, um, at the junction of the Three Lakes, and that was kind of the springing off point for fur trade in this area. Uh, so in 1749, he received official permission to trade with the Indians. He gathered his crew and his uh, giant canoe and they paddled across uh, the Great Lakes. It's, it's just amazing to me to think of two tons of goods, about uh, eight men in a birch bark canoe on Lake Michigan with no land in sight. Just unbelievable. Um, so they set off to come to the portage. Not sure if he knew he was coming here or um, had heard about it, but uh, he wanted to come to our area. So in 1749, they finally arrived at the portage, crossed over to the Wisconsin River, and went just a little ways downstream to the mouth of a tributary river. He set up his uh, trading post at the mouth of the river, probably on this high bluff here, which would have been a great spot to look out and see who was coming. And he would have built a post similar to this, again, courtesy of Mark uh, Tully and uh, would set up uh, a post, put out a shingle, and wait for the furs to arrive, which would of course be traded for um, trade goods. So what did they trade for? Well, we often think of trade beads, and they certainly did trade for beads, but they also traded for much um, more useful items, especially metal buckets, um, all kinds of fire starters, uh, anything that was useful, mirrors, paint, all kinds of things. And what were the Europeans getting in, in return? They were not getting hats, they were getting fur, specifically beaver fur. The beaver felt was highly prized for making hats, and it literally spanned the time period from George Washington all the way down to Abraham Lincoln. 
So all of wars fought, I mean really America can almost be tied to our existence, tied to the fur trade, because after the French and Indian War, which is all about fur trading, uh, the uh, British government was so impoverished that they started to tax us because we were supposed to pay for this war on American soil, which of course led to the American Revolution. So a lot of, uh, a lot of history tied to uh, beaver fur uh, from this area. Francois uh, Barbeau came back again uh, after that first season and came back, we believe, in 17, this winter of 1752-53. And as far as we know, there was, were the only two years he was here camped out uh, trading for furs. Not too many years later, in 1766, this gentleman, Jonathan Carver, uh, came down the Wisconsin Riverway on an expedition. He was a British explorer tasked with finding out, uh, mapping this area. They're still looking for a Northwest Passage some 300 years after uh, first arrival here. They're still hoping for a Northwest Passage across the United States. And uh, Carver became famous after this uh, expedition for publishing a book about the voyage in 1778, which included this map of the area. You can just barely make out uh, Door County here. We're getting a little bit of a sense of Wisconsin. And if we zoom in, we can get a little more detail on what he saw in our area. And this is actually the first map that I've been able to find that, that depicts the Baraboo River. So it's, here's the portage, here's the Wisconsin River, and here is the Baraboo River. Um, he also notes the, it's hard to read, but it's the uh, town of the Saugies, the Sauk Indians, down on the Sauk Prairie. And it's Carver that um, actually described the uh, Sauk Indians in detail. They had 90 houses on the Sauk Prairie. If we go back to our Google Earth image. Uh, part of Carver's expedition, but uh, actually not with him at the time, was a man named John or James Stanley Goddard, also with James Toot. And um, Carver got all of the sensate or all of the publicity because he actually published a book. But James Stanley Goddard also wrote a journal, which was not published but uh, has been found in the archives. And this is what Mark Tully found and really sealed the deal on who the Baraboo River was named for. Because Goddard wrote in 1766, uh, two leagues distant from the carrying place, in the west side is a small river called the River de Barbeau, so called from a Frenchman of that name wintering in it many years ago. The Indians frequently go up this river to their winter hunting in which they make a tolerable hunt having plenty of deer, bears, raccoons, beaver, etc. So that reference just uh, 14 years after um, Baraboe's uh, second expedition or second fur trading post here was made by James Stanley Goddard in 1766. So seals in my mind no doubt that the river was named after uh, a man. About 17 years after Goddard wrote this, Wisconsin became a territorial possession of the United States after the American Revolutionary War ended in 1783. Technically, however, the British remained in control until the War of 1812, the outcome of which finally established American presence in the area. Quite simply, there weren't enough of us to get out here and take over what we had won from the British back in 1783. Um, un under American control, the economy of the territory shifted from fur trading to lead mining. And Carver actually mentions lead in his report from 1766 going down the river. So Native Americans in the area, this is an actual uh, depiction of a Ho-Chunk Indian village uh, from the past. The Ho-Chunk Indians were largely in Wisconsin and had been for centuries. Although the fur trade wars and disease almost wiped out the tribe in the 1700s. The tribe also split into two factions during the first half of the 1700s with one group living in the Lake Winnebago area and along the Fox River and the other living down on the Rock River in Illinois. So here in the Baraboo area there were Ho-Chunk villages. Um, uh, we know of several along the Baraboo River. Jonathan Carver's map uh, shows an upper Ho-Chunk village on the Fox River and no indications of uh, Ho-Chunk on this side of the Wisconsin River, but they did come here later. By 1830, this map of the area, um, there are Winnebago uh, villages located on uh, the Baraboo River, although it's here miscorrectly uh, described as Bonobo's Creek, but there's an indication of 
the Winneb uh, Winnebago villages here. Three villages are listed uh, on the Beerbo River in an 1832 payment schedule to the Indians from the federal government with populations of 328, 312, and 244. So almost a thousand um, Ho-Chunk Indians on that payment schedule. Back to our Canfield map from 1872 down at the lower Oxbow. Amongst all those thousand-year-old Indian mounds, he notes an Indian council house or the remains of it, this was described as um, a round structure with a few poles still tied in the center with some um, uh, felt or um, pelts uh, still blowing in the breeze at the top. And they would have picked the same area as their ancient ancestors for uh, their village and settlement. And of course that's where Council Street gets its name down in that area. Indians, uh, Paleo Indians, uh, Ho-Chunk Indians were drawn to the Baraboo Rapids um, for uh, easy crossing places, but more importantly as fisheries. And uh, an 1850 article in the Sauk County Standard published here in Baraboo said, on these rapids were their fisheries from which they obtained some of their supplies. There on the south side of the river, only a league distant were the sugar camps, groves composed almost entirely of the sugar maple. I never beheld handsomer. They are nearly girdled down by their frequent tappings. These, those small prairies and frequent thickets on the north side of the river made fine haunts and green pastures for deer and small game, as well as the lordly elk. So imagine elk wandering around here. On the range of bluffs between this space and the Wisconsin River on the south, on those heavy oak ridges are fields well calculated for the bear. Another Ho-Chunk Indian village was known to be further up the uh, Baraboo River Valley uh, near Reedsburg, the future site of Reedsburg. This had 10 to 12 permanent lodges with other temporary lodges built as needed and also had burial grounds nearby. This would have been southwest of uh, the city of Reedsburg, about three miles. And uh, there was reports of at least four to 500 people at powwows at this uh, village site. This was the village of Chief Blue Wing who was Chief Ahochoka, who was well known for his integrity. He was the father of 10 children, and at least six of whom lived to adulthood. This is a picture of Chief Ahochoka, Blue Wing, taken by the Clisby sisters in Reedsburg. Um, story has it that he agreed to take, have his picture taken if they gave him 50 cents and three coats, which they did. He immediately donned all three coats and sat down for the picture. <laughs> so if you see, he is wearing wearing multiple coats. Um, he died in Toma in 1893. His relatives thought him to be 114 years old. Other bands lived along um, the Little Baraboo River at Laval and to near North Freedom as well. A piece from the Reedsburg Free Press in 1921 said, Deer were then very plentiful in this region and Late in the fall, bands of Indians with their ponies would make their yearly hunting trip southward for deer. After a couple weeks hunting, they would return to the Indian village with a bountiful supply of venison. On one of their hunting trips, as they returned through Loganville, in addition to a large quantity of deer meat on the backs of their pack ponies, there also hung the pelts of a wolf and a lynx. So the Ho-Chunk uh, hunted those animals. They also hunted bear that were in abundance. One visitor to the village saw the carcasses of five full-grown black bears and two cubs hanging in the trees. And occasionally an elk was also hunted. The Ho-Chunk also ate fruit, nuts, and wild games. A wild game raised some corn and potatoes for themselves and hay for their ponies. They would ingeniously cut potatoes into small pieces or slices and dry them, similar to dried apples. These were lighter to carry and were not as damaged by frost. A more familiar name in our area here in Baraboo is Chief Yellow Thunder, of course lived uh, in this area. Not sure when he was born, it could have been around 1774. So he grew up during that period of British control followed by U.S. takeover. In 1825, a treaty at Prairie du Chien set up the boundaries for the various tribes, including the Ho-Chunk, who were allotted all of southeastern Wisconsin. At the time of discovery of lead, lead deposits drew immigrants from throughout the U.S. 
and across uh, Europe to the area of northern Illinois and southwestern Wisconsin. Ho-Chunk lands came to be preempted by miners and pioneers who settled on what they considered the frontier of the American wilderness. In 1827, tensions came to a head when a warrior named Redbird exacted revenge on a number of settlers near Prairie du Chien and sparked what became known as the Winnebago War. In its aftermath, the U.S. Army constructed Fort Winnebago near the portage of the Fox and Wisconsin rivers in an attempt to maintain a military presence in the heart of Ho-Chunk territory. So after that, the Ho-Chunk were pushed out of southwestern Wisconsin, pushed northeast up into this area, and the Black Hawk War with the Sauk in 1832 also added more tension to the area. So for a short time in the 1830s, as this map shows, the Fox and Wisconsin waterway were the dividing line between American lands to the south and east and Indian lands to the north and west, including what would become Sauk County and, of course, the entire Baraboo River uh, watershed. In 1837, 20 Ho-Chunk Indians, including Chief Yellow Thunder, were invited to Washington uh, where they were coerced to sign a treaty giving up all of their lands in Wisconsin. They were told they would have eight years to move out when the actual wording was eight months. Uh, the Treaty of 1837 with the Ho-Chunk opened the land on the north and west sides of the Wisconsin River for settlement. And eventually the Ho-Chunk endured seven forced removals from 1840 to 1874. Many of them walked hundreds of miles back, including Chief Yellow Thunder, probably several, several times, and he beat the system in 1849 by going to Mineral Point and simply purchasing 40 acres of land, which became known as Yellow, uh, Chief Yellow Thunder's 40 and was a haven for Ho-Chunk Indians in the area, and as a landowner, he could not be forcibly removed. In 1874, uh, Chief Yellow Thunder died. This is an absolutely remarkable photo from the year before, taken by H.H. H. Bennett of the Dells. Um, at his uh, 40, just northwest uh, or north of Baraboo, near Highway A. Said to be over 100 years old, but possibly very likely considerably less. We just don't know. So that brings us to um, White Settlement. Before official news of the Treaty of 1837 even reached the Ho-Chunk back in Wisconsin, Early settlers with connections heard about it and immediately began crossing the Wisconsin River looking for land to claim. S.A. Dwinolf, an early settler in Reedsburg, described the county as it was then. The county abounded in prairies of gently undulating surfaces of all sizes from 1,000 to 20,000 acres, generally surrounded by groves of timber or beautiful bur oak openings, many of which resembled an ancient apple orchard. So that would be the Sauk Prairie at over 14,000 acres and others like Babs Prairie near Reedsburg with 1,000 acres. So if settlement first concentrated in the Sauk Prairie area, of course, the flattest land, treeless, and um, uh, easy to get to. Uh, the prairie itself and the Honey Creek watershed uh, to the west in the bluffs of the Bearbo River area were the first settled people coming from uh, two routes, either Madison and up through what's now Prairie de Sac, or from Fort Winnebago and coming into the northeast part of the county. Uh, eventually when the prairie started to fill up, then they started to push over the bluffs and come here to the Baraboo River Valley. Very often early settlers uh, just appropriated abandoned Indian resources. James Christie, a Scotchman, settled in March of 1840 over by North Freedom, uh, the Ho-Chunk had been removed the year before, and Christie moved into an abandoned Ho-Chunk village of Chief Dandy, where two lodges were still standing. He made one a temporary house and the other a stable. There were also uh, Indian cornfields nearby, so he was uh, able to use those. Here in Baraboo, uh, Abe Wood built the first uh, permanent settler's cabin in 1839. This is now, or was, in Oxner Park and there is a stone marker placed there in the 1920s uh, right by the large shelter at Oxner Park where his uh, original cabin apparently stood. By August of 1842, early settlers had explored the area all the way up to what would become Waniwak, so the Baraboo River being a conduit up into uh, the unknown. 
course, they were attracted here to um, cheap land and plenty of natural resources. Of course, we talked about the furs, which were still somewhat a commodity at this point, but not nearly as much. Uh, of course, the next natural resource to be exploited was the timber, and there was plenty of it. Uh, the pine was turned into lumber. Hardwoods became railroad ties, barrel stave, charcoal, and firewood for railroad engines eventually. In the winter of 1840-41, uh, an Irish immigrant, Archibald Barker, uh, cut logs in Seely Creek Pinery and was the first to run logs down the river, the Baraboo River, in the spring. Barker had helped finish the first dam, just literally upstream from where we're sitting tonight, uh, and a sawmill there on the Baraboo Rapids. After Barker had his logs cut just a few feet from here into lumber, they were turned into lumber rafts, and he was the first to run a load of lumber down the Baraboo River. While still getting through the Baraboo Rapids somewhere here in town, he came across a dam. And he wrote this, In running down the cribs to the lower end of the rapids where we coupled up, one day in company with Ed Kingsley going down each on a crib, I hallooed to him to look and see that somebody seemed to have a dam of stones across the river. As we approached, we saw it was the backs and tails of fishes. We were soon amongst them and found they were sturgeons. I killed three with my hand spike. In jumping into the water to get them, I was knocked down by their running against my legs. For a short distance, the river seemed to be jammed full of them. Of course, the fish kind of got stopped by <laughs> what's coming next. Uh, water power, of course, especially in the Baraboo River or the Baraboo area here, uh, the river is dropping over 40 feet. Um, and that uh, rapid sound to people meant that they could build dams here. So, as we mentioned, the first dam was built here in the winter of 1839-40, along with uh, the first sawmill on the Baraboo River, and um, eventually more followed. Eventually there was 11 dams on the Baraboo River and a ton of mills and other uh, industries that were powered by the water of the Baraboo River. For the next 15 years, 1840 to 1855, settlements were pushed further and further up the Baraboo River, beginning here at Baraboo in 1839-40 and up until the mid-1850s. Agriculture, of course, was soon to follow. And after farmers settled and communities grew, there was a need for grist mills. Of course, wheat was the cash crop of the day, especially before the Civil War, and uh, could be uh, sold uh, for good money. Wisconsin was a leading producer of wheat by the time of the Civil War. This is the Bassett Mill that was built here in Baraboo down on Water Street uh, in 1855. It became the largest such mill ever built in the county, eventually with six runs or six large uh, millstones. Here's another view of that area from 1867. This is on uh, First, you gotta think about this, First Avenue at Oak Street looking southeast. So here's the Ash Walnut Street Bridge. This is Water Street, and here's the Bassett Mill. This is the south side of uh, Baraboo. You look at these early photos, by the way, and it seems like they either cut every single tree down when they came, or there was a lot less trees here um, due to burning off. I'm not sure which, probably a little bit of both, because they do describe oak savannas and things all over. This was another uh, enterprise here in Baraboo, just literally north of where we're sitting tonight, the um, Baraboo Furniture Company. Um, I think this is the Island Woolen Mill back here, and then the Baraboo Manufacturing Company uh, was built here in the 1860s to produce uh, lots and lots of furniture, especially chairs and tables. And I met somebody once that had a wooden chair from this factory. So if it's one of you or you know who it is, let me know, because we want to see that chair again. As I mentioned, there were eventually 11 dams along the Baraboo River. One of them, after this dam on this side of the river, Oxbow, was washed out, they decided to build the dam over here on the Oxbow at this location and cut a chase across this peninsula of land. That's what created the island of the northern part of the peninsula. And this is the island woolen mill. We are literally sitting right here. And this wall of this building is still in our staircase at the north end of this building. Uh, the Island Woolen Mill, of course, uh, one of the largest 
uh, industries on the river. Here's the Island Woolen Mill a few years later. This is the back of the building you're sitting in tonight. And here's the rest of it that was burned down and later demolished in the 60s and 70s. This, of course, was the largest uh, employer in Sauk County at one time um, and the largest woolen mill west of Philadelphia. Uh, the dams were essentially utilitarian, but some, some were especially here at the Island Woolen Mill. A little decorative in 1913, they built a new dam and made it a little decorative with these overlooks on either side. Some people attribute this to Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, it's never been proven. Uh, the McFetridges who owned the Island Woolen Mill here were good friends with Wright, actually too good of friends because they lent him money and only got Japanese art prints in return. Um, <laughs> they probably got the better end of the deal in all in all, but um, certainly Wrighty and, and uh, concrete overlooks with mussel shells stuck into the concrete. So the river at first was seen as very utilitarian, but eventually was seen as a beautiful uh, place. So we talk about the railroad next. That is a, a, almost a marriage with the Baraboo River. That was the only way to get through this area. And it was uh, the railroad that really made these towns along the Baraboo River uh, thrive. Of course, the problem with getting a railroad into Sauk County was these bluffs. Uh, the railroad had crossed here at Kilbourne or Wisconsin Dells in the 1850s and also down here at Spring Green where you can see it's nice and flat, but it would take over uh, 30 years after settlement here before a railroad would penetrate the uh, center of Sauk County. Of course, nature did provide a way through. Uh, the Devil's Lake Gap was the way into the quartzite canoe on the south side and up at Rock Springs, or the Upper Narrows, was the way out of the quartzite canoe. But it still was a lot of work to put a railroad through from Madison. In 1871, uh, track laying began, uh, reaching Baraboo by the fall of 1871, and two years later, reaching Kendall in 1873. Here is the railroad um, at Rock Springs or Abelman as it was then known. This would have been very similar to how the Baraboo Depot looked and the railroad at the time. So the Baraboo River, or the uh, railroad was able to follow the Baraboo River once it got into uh, Baraboo from Merrimack. And that was really the path of least resistance all the way up to get to La Crosse. And uh, so it had this uh, marriage with the Baraboo River. When the railroad arrived, many sizes or many uh, communities doubled in size in just a few years. And eventually by 1896, the railroad was so successful that it was double tracked all the way from Madison up to La Crosse. At the height, there would be eight passenger trains from each direction coming through Baraboo along with all of the freight trains. I don't know how anybody got any sleep. <laughs> So now we'll talk about the 10 communities that are along uh, the Baraboo River. Some were um, literally started uh, because of the Baraboo River. Others were started by the railroad as it came through. So the first area as settled would have been right here uh, in Baraboo in 1830, late 1830s. As we mentioned, the river drops 40 feet and they heard the sound of those rapids and knew that they could dam the river here. Um, this map, of course, back to 1872, shows the two oxbows that also created unique situations for building dams and long mill races to create more flow of water. Uh, settlement uh, started around those uh, dams. There was eventually five in the Baraboo area. <coughs> and uh, Baraboo got a further boost when it was decided that it would become the county seat in 1846. Who knows the original county seat for Sauk County? Prairie de Sac. For a couple of years, Prairie de Sac was the um, county seat. Uh, when, it was when it came up to decide where the county seat would be held, since there were only Sauk Prairie or Sauk City and Prairie de Sac, it was decided that there'd be a little competition between the two villages. 
and see which village would offer the most land or buildings to the county for their use. Well, Sauk City offered the largest building it had for use as a courthouse, but Prairie de Sac apparently offered more empty lots that were worth more value, and it was decided that the county seat would be in Prairie de Sac, so a small courthouse was built there in 1844. However, it was discovered that the uh, provision of Sa or Prairie de Sac's gift was that if the county seat ever moved, those lots would revert back to their original donors. And that made the people in Sauk City and the few people up here in the Baraboo River Valley very mad. And uh, it was decided in 1846 to hold a referendum to decide whether the county seat should be moved here to the Baraboo Valley. Now, mind you, there was nothing here except a few dams and a few cabins but it was decided to move the county seat here to the Baraboo Valley. So it was actually Sauk County government that platted a village called Adams around a public square, and then all of these lots were sold off eventually to raise money for the county. That was in March, or that was platted in April of 1847. Literally the same month with the same surveyor, George Brown platted a village called Baraboo, mostly located on the south side, but encompassing his dam location at Oak Street and included the lots on Water Street. So the, lit the two plats literally touched, here's a, a putting them together, and um, the federal government decided to call our post office Bear Roo because there was far too many atoms across the country and that was confusing. So it wasn't too long, in 1852 both plats were combined and simply called Bear Roo. However, if you do hold a deed from this area of town, even today, your, your, your deed will say Lot 6, Block, block 4, Baraboo, formerly Adams. Or if it's down here, it will say Lot 6, Block 4, Baraboo, original plat. So that did help boost our um, economy and settlement. Here's uh, one of the earliest pictures of Baraboo from 1866. You'll recognize the Bassett Mill that we saw earlier. This is from the south side uh, on Lynn Street, kind of near the Circus World Library, looking northeast across the Ash Walnut Street Bridge, which is being rebuilt in 1866 after a spring flood washed out every dam and bridge on the Baraboo River. Um, not too much exists on this map anymore, except these houses here still exist on First Street, just south of the Civic Center. And we're going to fade through to a modern view of the same area. I like the old picture better, I think, so. <laughs> but here are those couple of houses up here on First Street. Here's Baraboo from 1870 when the first bird's eye of Baraboo was drawn. We've grown just about as, we about as big as we possibly can without having a railroad. All of the wheat here from Bassett's Mill, all of the lumber, the chairs, the spokes, the wagon wheels we're making, all had to be carted out of here up to the Dells or, God forbid, over the bluffs down to Sauk City to get on a steamer to be sh uh, shipped out. So we've grown just about as far as we can from Center Street on the uh, west side to roughly East Street on the east side here. Fortunately for us, the railroad arrived in 1871 um, and the town grew. Here's the earliest picture that we have of the square, looking from the bank corner at 3rd and Oak, northwest towards the county courthouse. The buildings back here are the old Wisconsin house, which is where the Al Ringling Theater sits today. And there's our 1855 uh, brick courthouse that became the pride of the county. These two columns, still exist up on 10th Street as the front porch of a home. After the building burned down in 1904, they were salvaged. So the railroad arrived in 1871, and we not only got that all-important depot and connection to the rest of the world, Baraboo was chosen to become a division headquarters for Chicago and Northwestern, and that was a huge boost. So 200 miles of track were dispatched, managed, repaired, and conducted out of Baraboo, and that grew to 500 miles of track uh, as Chicago and Northwestern grew. So this is a fantastic photo from 1871 of Baraboo's Roundhouse, which was eight stalls originally, and eventually grew to 28 stalls by the time it reached its full height. That meant there were um, three to 400 railroad uh, employees here with all of their families 
uh, in Baraboo. Eventually, in 1902, a new uh, depot was built. Uh, it would have been one story. This is larger than Madison, by the way, except that this was the division headquarters office upstairs. So scores of dispatchers, conductors, managers, um, all the payroll, everything done out of that building. And of course, uh, our claim to fame, the circus, was also helped by the river. The Ringling Brothers chose the site along an old uh, stave factory along the Baraboo River to uh, site their winter quarters. They needed access to fresh, well, seemingly fresh water and a uh, place to shovel all of the bad stuff <laughs> uh, and let it go. Um, and eventually, uh, Ringlingville was built to house all of their animals, equipment, and so forth. They were also, of course, helped immensely by the railroad connection when they switched to a rail uh, circus in 1890. Their cousins, uh, the Golmars, also had a um, circus in town, but first we'll look at uh, a camel team there along the Baraboo River. And of course, literally provided uh, places for animals like elephants to bathe. And that heritage is uh, preserved at Circus World like never before. Here's a rare shot, thanks to Ralph Pierce, of the Golmar Brothers Circus Winter Quarters, which was literally kitty corner from where we are sitting tonight. So if you went across the Second Avenue Bridge here, which is right here on the right side, this is Mary Roundtree Evans Park. This is the Golmar Brothers Winter Quarters. So for roughly 25 years, there were two circus winter quarters on the Baraboo River within just maybe half a mile of each other. Of course, their poop was all going down to <laughs> their cousins, so. <laughs> Next we switch, we're, now we're gonna go upstream to these other communities. Uh, the community of Lyons was one of the first platted in Sauk County, the village of Lyons named after Lyons, New York, where these New Yorkers would come and just bring their own town, town names with them, which is why we have the town of Troy and other places like that in Sauk County. This was uh, actually platted by uh, Harvey Canfield, William Canfield's father, and he made a central square in the village of West or Lyons that was named after New York Governor DeWitt Clinton, who was responsible for the Erie Canal. Now, of course, nearby, but not actually in Lyons was the Island Woolen Mill, which provided plenty of employment eventually for residents in Lyons. And also one of the earliest uh, dams was also near Lyons. Here is um, the furthest dam upriver in the Baraboo area called the Upper Dam. This one's uh, quite forgotten in history because it didn't uh, last too much into the 20th century. And we can overlay this now thanks to Sauk County Mapping Department with um, modern topography or modern satellite images. So here is Gander Mountain Slumberland and here's the old Highway 12, now Highway BD Bridge. So potentially this riprap in the river here is still remnants of that early dam in that area. They produced uh, lumber there for 30 or 40 years as well as uh, furniture and parts for wagon wheels. Uh, it was so, so robust in 1859 that Canfield included it as a side picture on his 1859 map of Sauk County. So this literally is the older, old Highway 12 bridge, the sawmill, and the Ryan and Hollebeck chair and cabinet works. In 1956, uh, the village was incorporated as West Baraboo and as, um, as you see it now, Haskins Park, one of the nicest uh, parks along the entire Baraboo River, um, even including a handicapped launch for kayaks and canoes. <coughs> we move up river to North Freedom. Uh, dam was not uh, initially, no dam was actually built here, so it's a bit of an anomaly as to why North Freedom got a start, but in 1849, uh, the first settlers arrived in the area, Samuel and Densey Hackett. Um, 
1856, John Hackett, the son of Samuel, builds the first house at the Four Corners in North Freedom. 1857, there was a sawmill in operation by Bloom and Kimball. And 1870, the first store was set up in the village, but at the wrong end, the east end, when it was later the west end that flourished. In 1872, the railroad arrived after coming through Baraboo and a depot was set up initially called Blooms after a certain settler's last name. In 1872, the first post office was set up in the village and since the village uh, was in the northern part of the town of Freedom, it was called North Freedom. In 1887, North Freedom got a real boost when uh, the first iron mining boom came to the area south of there. And for a short time, the name of the village was actually changed to Bessemer after um, a man who invented a new way to uh, smelt ore. The village's mail and freight, however, were often mistakenly routed to Bessemer, Michigan, <laughs> so it was decided to change the name to North Freedom. By 1893, the village was incorporated. This is a later iron boom that happened uh, around the 1900 uh, when um, ore was again discovered south of North Freedom in LaRue. Today, North Freedom uh, has a fine kayak rental, so you can get on there and paddle down the Bearwa River. And of course, is also the home of Mid-Continent Railway Museum. And I think I'm correct in saying that the bridge is going to be fixed from the North Freedom Spur to the main line. So hopefully, if the steam train gets on line again in 2019, we will uh, hopefully have steam running back through Baraboo. Rock Springs, or Abelman as its first name, uh, was uh, next up the Baraboo River. This was um, first called Abelman after its most famous settler, Colonel Stephen von Rensselaer Abelman, who was from New York. In 1848, he made his first trip to Sauk County and laid claim to the property where Narrows Creek meets the Baraboo River. He knew that if the railroad was gonna come through, it would have to travel through this area and um, that would be of benefit to him. So in 1853, Colonel Abelman laid out the village, originally naming it Excelsior, he wasn't naming it after himself, after the New York State motto, and the name was later changed to Abelman in his honor. In 1857, he set up a sawmill, later added a steam-powered grist mill. But of course, its uh, boom came in 1872 when the railroad arrived, uh, just winding its way up the Bearba River. The colonel was instrumental in getting the railroad through the Baraboo Valley as early as 1869. He was uh, promoting it and he became the president of the Baraboo Airline Railroad Company, which proposed to construct a railroad through the Baraboo Valley. They were soon bought out, however, by the much larger Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, which was their intention, which had interest in far more capital to build the line through. The village was uh, later called Rock Springs for obvious reasons and a quarry was eventually developed there as well. Here's an early 1908 photo of the downtown and the namesake of the village. The quarry is still in operation today, of course, uh, hauling out uh, Pink Quartzite. And one of Sauk County's four National Historic Landmarks is just north of the village, Van Heis Rock has been um, known by geologists and used for teaching for over a hundred years. The rock is named in honor of the University of Wisconsin professor Charles Van Heis, who is a renowned geologist, cons conservationist, and president of the Was University of Wisconsin. In the 1890s, Van Heis used this outcrop to demonstrate the kinds of changes that occur in rocks during periods of mountain forming and countless geologists and students have visited Van Heis Rock since then and the Baraboo Hills as a geologist mecca. And the other part of the name, Springs, comes from the Artesian Spring that still uh, pumps out water day and night at Rock Springs and you can go get your own at the side of the road. 
Now we move up to Reedsburg. Um, the present site of Reedsburg was occupied by D.C. Reed in 1847. It was said that he was brought hither by a reported discovery of iron ore, and although he found no iron, the excellent water power then unoccupied induced him to remain, and this was at a natural ford in the river. So we entered 200 acres of land, and this, by the way, is the original plat of Reedsburg, and I'm sure the um, surveyor was mortified when he discovered that he had uh, spelled it wrong. So there's, there's the R. The H was intentional. That was the original spelling of Reedsburg, but that was dropped after a few years. Uh, Reed entered, D.C. Reed entered 200 acres of land and also laid claim to the water power. In June of 1847, he commenced the construction of a dam, and the next spring, several crude shelters were constructed, which would become known as Shanty Row. Reed's sawmill was put into operation in the summer of 1848, and settlements slowly increased. Although the winter of 1848 and 49 in Reedsburg was known as the starving time. In 1849, a post office was established with mail being fetched from Baraboo once a week by foot. The village was eventually platted in 1852, but a village charter was not obtained until 1868. And of course, uh, this was the site of the famous saw log war between Baraboo and Reedsburg in the spring of 1851. And if you'll let me get a drink, we'll talk about that. The saw log started when um, lumbermen who were cutting logs north of north and west of uh, Reedsburg were floating them down the Bearville River and they would come to the dam of Mr. D.C. Reed. Usually the water was high enough and D.C. Reed could take the dam down a little bit and let the logs go over and all was well. But by 1851 Reed was fed up with doing this due to the damage and the hassle and he refused to let the logs go over his dam. Uh, Reed engaged a man to go to, so this of course got the lumbermen up in arms, and there was fear of a um, conflict, so Reed engaged a man to go to Milwaukee to carry a complaint to the U.S. Marshal. And in those days, if you went and found a U.S. Deputy Marshal and appealed to him in person, he had to respond in person. So the Deputy Marshal came from Milwaukee, and uh, unfortunately to well, unfortunately to the lumbermen, the deputy marshal seized all the logs held at Reedsburg because he knew some of them were cut illegally from federal land, probably all of them, uh, as property of the United States and ordered that they be floated down to Baraboo to be sold. So with the wisdom of Solomon, he seized the logs from the lumbermen but made D.C. Reed take the dam down and let the logs come down to Baraboo so that they could be purchased down here. He did allow, however, some of the lumber that had already been cut from the logs to stay in Reedsburg and be sold. However, some of this apparently had already been taken away uh, in his absence. Uh, the village of Reedsburg was eventually platted in 1852, as we mentioned, and this is how it looked about 1867. So only one dam ever in Reedsburg there and Main Street, uh, where the current Main Street Bridge is today. And we're looking east down Main Street. I sound like a broken record, but the city again also prospered with the coming of the railroad quite substantially. This literally was like the modern equivalent of the internet uh, revolution coming to your town. Reedsburg eventually also supported a large woolen mill um, right along the river. Here's the dam and the Main Street Bridge. This was uh, another large establishment that lasted longer than the woolen mill here. The Island Woolen Mill closed in 1849, and Reedsburg's woolen mill lasted until 18, or 1968. Reedsburg's downtown prospered uh, after the arrival of the railroad, and has some fine buildings, the finest uh, landmark there being the old um, Hotel Stolte, which was built in 1896. This would have been the equivalent to our Warren Hotel. Moving up to Laval. Um, Laval, of course, is a derivation of the French word for valley. In 1849, a Mr. J.F. Hamlin arrived and laid claim to the water power at what is now the village. 
With the help of Solomon Rushmore, a dam was soon put in and a sawmill constructed, which opened for business in 1850. 1864, the sawmill was purchased uh, by Sanford, who added a flour barrel factory. Barrels were an important item in those days. They were the cardboard box of their day, and uh, virtually everything uh, was shipped in barrels or wooden boxes. Sanford also added the capacity to make uh, broom handles at this location, and the grist mill was added to the complex so that residents could get finely ground local flour. In 1872, the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad arrived. Sanford, the Sanford sawmill was later changed into a stave factory, staves being the parts of a barrel. And later another steam-powered factory was constructed for the manufacture of more barrel staves. In 1879, the Reedsburg and Laval mills produced over one and a half million staves every year. The staves were used to make barrels um, to ship everything out from nails and buttons to food. The Laval train depot was a very busy place. Many station managers couldn't handle the pace. In the 1880s, the Chicago and Northwestern managers sent an energetic young man to try and organize the untidy Laval depot. This young man was named Emmanuel Phillip. Some say Phillip's good work at Laval caught the attention of people and eventually put him on the path to becoming the governor of Wisconsin. A railroad spur between Laval and Casanova was operated from about 1910 to 1935. Besides running trains, the line also ran converted Model Ts, which delivered mail. Now we leave Sauk County, go to Juneau County into Waniwak, which was uh, First explored in this area of the county was first explored in 1842 by George Willard, Don Carlos Berry, and Alexander Draper, but it wasn't until 1851 when first settlers George and Lucinda Willard arrived and built a home and dam but failed to file the claim and obtain rightful ownership. So two Reedsburg land speculators filed the claim and proposed to sell Willard the land he was already living and working on. Willard, however, failed to raise the $612 asking price and lost all but his home and mill to the speculators. Hard times. 1855, the village was platted. The name may have evolved from an Indian expression meaning they howl, or it may mean the place of the evil spirit. I'll go with the first one. In April, April 21st, 1859, Waniwak's uh, most famous citizen was born, Belle Case, who uh, at the very uh, early age moved here to Baraboo where she grew up, but she was born near Waniwak and of course became the wife of Bob La Follette. She was, however, in her own right, the first female graduate of the UW Law School in 1885. Upon graduation, Belle taught high school in Spring Green and later junior high school here in Baraboo. One of her students in Baraboo was none other than John Ringling, of whom she later wrote, when John read a long account, interrupted with giggles from the school, of the sideshows he and the other boys had been giving every night, I lectured him and drew the moral that if John would put his mind on his lessons, as he did on his sideshows, he might yet become a scholar. <laughs> Fortunately, the scolding had no effect. At the UW, uh, Belle Case refended her future husband, Bob LaFollette, and they were married in December of 1881. Belle was often cited, or today is often cited, as the brains behind Bob LaFollette, who was a longtime Wisconsin congressman, senator, and governor, of course. They had four children, and their son, Robert Jr., succeeded Bob Sr. as senator, and son, Philip, became governor of Wisconsin. So good water up in Waniwak. Waniwak quickly grew again after the arrival of the railroad and in 1878 was incorporated as a village with a population of 558. Um, I'm not sure what the current population is, but um, you can still see the uh, remnants of that wealth as depicted in these brick buildings downtown. Now there was yet another circus winter quarters on the Baraboo River, and that was the circus of Dode Fisk, his real name was Theodore, but his nickname was Dode, 
Fisk. He was born in 1860 at the Wanning Walk farm of his parents. He learned animal training skills at an early age and he started the Dode Fisk Society Circus, which he ran for several years and wintered near Wanning Walk at his farm along the Bear Woo River. This show grew from a dog and pony show to a railroad show with 13 cars and one elephant. But by, eight, by 1911, he sold his circus and became a traveling ballroom dance instructor with his wife, Ella. <laughs> Back here in Baraboo in the winter of 1909-1910, the Muller brothers of Baraboo made this set of wagons for the Dode Fisk Circus and pictured here on 3rd Avenue. Today, Wani Walk uh, also has a kayak rental, so a great place right next to the bike path to um, get onto the Baraboo River. We next moved to Union Center, the smallest community on the Baraboo River. In 1857, a sawmill was built uh, here, and by the 1860s, two sawmills were in operation, both making lumber, timber, and railroad ties, also hop poles. The hops uh, crop hung on in Juneau County past the boom of the 1860s and the hop poles were needed into the 1870s. By 1872, the village had two sawmills, a hotel, creamery, blacksmith, drugstore, and two general stores. And I assure you, they do not have that today. Uh, in 1903, the Hillsboro and Hillsboro Northeastern Railroad built the nation's shortest rail line of five miles up the valley to Hillsboro, but connecting it to the all-powerful Chicago Northwestern line. Here is the current post office in Union Center. In 1913, the village was incorporated as a village with 170 residents. Uh, to its credit, in 1942, Wisconsin Dairy Co-ops built a milk processing plant there. And here's another picture. I think that's the milk processing plant or the building in the background there. <coughs> Next we come to Elroy, which was the earliest spot of European settlement uh, this far up in the Baraboo River Valley. In 1856, James Brintnall built a dam and set up a sawmill at a narrow point here on the Baraboo River. And it's really fun to ride the trail up the Baraboo River because you see it get smaller and smaller and you're it's just kind of fun as it just turns into a stream. Um, in 1859, eight, Brittenall and J.M. Bennett lay out the first section of Elroy. And Brittenall's daughter, Lydia, wanted to name the town Leroy after her boyfriend. But the federal postal authorities said there already was a town by that name in Wisconsin. So Brittenall's daughter suggested reversing the first two letters and Elroy was born. <laughs> By the 1860s, the, the community had a store, blacksmith, wagon shop, livery stable, and an inn, but again, really did not prosper until the railroad came. Now, that was in December of 1872, almost a year, ap or more than a year after it was uh, reached Baraboo. It took a lot of effort to get this railway built. January of 1873, uh, the West Wisconsin Railroad, which later became the Chicago, St. Paul, and Minneapolis and Omaha, moved its southern terminal from Toma down to Elroy. And uh, so this made Elroy a crisscross of a couple different railroads to its, much to its credit. By September of 1873, the Chicago Northwestern Line was completed all the way to Winona, Minnesota, completing the original track from Madison all the way up to Winona. In 1879, Elroy incorporated as a village, and in 1883, a 10-stall roundhouse was built for the Omaha Railroad, and also nearby, the Chicago Northwestern built its own three-stall roundhouse. And this is a fabulous model of the rail yard at Elroy at the little museum in the village. It was a very busy place because of those two railroads uh, converging there. In 1901, in September, was called a red letter day on a Sunday at the roundhouse and shops. In just 24 hours, 25 steam engines were moved into and out of the roundhouse for service. In March of 1902, 11,211 rail cars were interchanged between the Chicago and Omaha lines. By December, four crews were keeping two switch engines moving day and night to keep up the pace. Eight warehouses were located next to the tracks for freight storage. 
At its height, there were often over 50 passenger and freight trains a day coming through Elroy. 1905, Elroy reached its peak population of only 2,000. By 1930, that had fallen to 1,546, but still enough uh, to have some fine brick buildings there. One of Elroy's claims to fame, depending on which side of the aisle you're on, is um, the birthplace of former Governor Tommy Thompson, who was born in Elroy in 1941 and Wisconsin governor from 1987 to 2001, Wisconsin's longest serving governor. By 1963, passenger service had ended in uh, Elroy, which is a big blow. It was also uh, the year that passenger service, of course, ended here in Baraboo. And in 1964, freight service also ended in Elroy. But not to uh, be weighed down too long, the old railroad line uh, in 1967, the Elroy Sparta Trail became the America's first rail to trails conversion. And we can see the uh, fruits of that even today as mile after mile of rail is converted to trail. <coughs> Later in 1992, a 12.5 mile trail was um, made on the old Omaha line coming out of Elroy. So there was, so when you get to Elroy, there's an, a lovely option of going in two different directions. Lastly, on the Bear River, we get to Kendall, the furthest community upriver. Uh, the river was too small to dam at this point. Uh, just downstream a little bit was a, a place called Glendale, which was the last point upstream on the river where somebody tried to establish a dam. However, Glendale did not thrive or survive. In 1857, Truman and Mary Thorpe arrived on the banks uh, here where the village would eventually be established. But Kendall really owes its existence to the railroad. In 1870, Levi Kendall, a railroad building contractor from Baraboo, purchased the rights, the railroad rights through the Thorpe farm for $100 for the Chicago Northwestern line. Eventually, the Thorpes would sell the rest of their farm to Kendall, who never lived in the village that bears his name today. Construction of three tunnels northwest of Kendall, and if you've been on the, the trail, you can ride through those, necessitated construction workers in the area for several months. Tunnels one and two are 1,700 feet long each, and tunnel three was 3,800 3, feet long. So it took quite a bit of uh, manpower and money to build those railroad tunnels. Uh, in 1873, in September, Chicago Northwestern Railroad opens for business. And eventually, as you can see in the photo, a roundhouse was also built at Kendall. Eventually, it became uh, 14 stalls and had the largest turntable in western Wisconsin. Kendall was uh, located at the end of the hill division, which meant uh, it got um, hilly beyond Kendall more than usual, and pusher or helper engines were kept at Kendall to help other engines up grades and through those tunnels. So in 1894, the village was incorporated, and with it came some ordinances. One of those said billiard halls, saloons, and bowling saloons were heavily regulated. All forms of public entertainment were liable to inspection. No card games, gambling, dice, or minors were allowed, and they were not allowed to open on Sundays. Riots, obscenity, and lewd gestures were outlawed with penalties ranging from five to 60 days in jail. Animals were also regulated. Stallions and mares were to, quote, meet in enclosed barns or secluded spaces. <laughs> Little eyes. By the 1910s, uh, Kendall was established as a farm market center. It actually had two banks, a feed mill, creamery, butcher, and implement dealer, along with a stockyard. And of course, that 1963 date comes up again when the railroad tracks were abandoned. And uh, 66, the DNR purchases the right of way for a bike trail. So those are the communities. I want to talk about just two other subjects as we wrap it up. One would be the bridges uh, across the Baraboo River. And some of you already know this, but uh, how many bridges do you think cross the Baraboo River from start to finish? Do you want to guess? Did I hear 27? 27. There are actually 91 bridges that cross the Baraboo River. That would include, and I, I went up Google Maps and counted every single one. There are 60 road bridges, so there's over 10 bridges just in Baraboo alone. 
uh, 60 road bridges, 10 active railroad bridges, 19 former railroad bridges, now bike paths, and two foot bridges. Um, the one by Circus World and the one just upstream here, the old Manchester Street Bridge. So of course the early bridges were wood. Uh, this is actually the Narrows Creek Bridge uh, as it enters the Bear River at Rock Springs. Way back, uh, first uh, covered bridge was in 1873 in um, Baraboo. This is a this is again that 1866 bridge at Ash and Walnut. But the first covered bridge was actually built right here next to this building in 1873 by the Island Woolen Mill. This is not a picture of it. We don't have a picture of it. This is a, another Sauk County covered bridge, but the one here was 140 feet long with no support. A few years later, another one was built 166 feet long at Ash and Walnut. There were later three covered bridges uh, in or near Abelman, Rock Springs, and one in Fairfield, the Butterfield Bridge. All in all, there were six covered bridges in Sauk County, and if you want to experience one here, you can't because they're all gone, but <laughs> the, only, the only historic covered bridge in Wisconsin uh, still left is the one at Cedarburg, uh, it's been moved just a little bit from its original location, but roughly in the same spot. They would not have had a center support to begin with. Uh, and I believe this was actually built by Baraboo resident Jerry Dodd. The sign here says that this was built of Baraboo pine. Yes? When you said 91, is that present or is that total bridges that were on? No, just now. Just, just now. now. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, the sign at Cedarburg says this bridge was built of Baraboo pine. It's construction of crisscross. 3 by 10 timbers matches exactly the descriptions of the Baraboo bridges at the time. And um, I am convinced that this was built by Jerry Dodd, who built all six covered bridges here in Sauk County. Of course, later bridges were built of steel. Here's a uh, road bridge at Abelman. And here is uh, probably the largest steel bridge across the Baraboo River ever, the um, old high bridge here in Baraboo connecting Oak Street to vine on the south side. It's hard to tell in the picture, but this is the Oak Street Dam, and here is the Ash Walnut Street Bridge in the background, Water Street being on the side here. When was the high bridge removed? This was, uh, this was I think I have a picture, this was removed, this is Manchester, but the high bridge was removed in 1929 after the Broadway Bridge had been built in 1928. They were contemplating rebuilding the high bridge where it was, but the problem was that it crossed the railroad tracks at the depot at grade, and they wanted to get all this newfangled automobile traffic to go under the railroad, so they decided to build the Broadway Bridge, the first ever bridge at that location, and route the traffic under the railroad tracks as we have it today. This is the Manchester Street Bridge as it uh, was sited down uh, at its original location, uh, built in 1884. This was slated to be uh, demolished in the 1980s when it was discovered that this was the last Camelback through truss bridge in the state of Wisconsin. So it was decided to move it and they cut it apart, hauled it through town. There's the Circus World Library and it was of course set up just a few yards from here as a new footbridge across the Baraboo River. Later bridges were, of course, built of concrete. This is actually the Shaw Street Bridge, just uh, a few rods this way being all formed up and ready to pour with all that hand-mixed concrete japers creepers. So this is West Bear, in the background here, Haskins Park, off to the left eventually. I was just looking, there's, there's the mixer to make all the concrete. Goodness. Uh, I'd have to check some other notes, but I think around 1908. Um, there had been an earlier bridge here in the 1860s. I think that was washed out in that 1866 flood. So for about 40 years, there was no bridge from here to West Baraboo. There was some foot bridges across. Some people would walk across the railroad bridge, but it really wasn't until this bridge was put in that there was this connection to uh, West Baraboo. Here's another view of that bridge when it was completed looking north. So here is um, probably a temporary uh, dam for the island woolen mill. And here's the old Platt Ice House 
on the uh, shore of the Bear River. And if you go to Haskins Park and look across the river, there is a house built on the foundations of this former Platt Ice House. Here is the Broadway Bridge built in 1928. And as we talked about, routed under the railroad so that we didn't have to deal with those crossings anymore. And if you're of a certain age, you can remember when all Beerbo's bridges looked like this with these lovely classical uh, balustrades. Of course, that bridge was replaced with the current bridge, I think, in 2004, again, of pre-stressed concrete. And our latest bridge across the Beerbo River is the new um, Highway 12 uh, crossing. I believe this is... It's, it's over 100 feet off the uh, Baraboo River, and it's, it's certainly the highest bridge now to cross the Baraboo River. Mm. Bridges were also subject to accident. This happened right over here in Haskins, what's now Haskins Park, uh, when the railroad used to go through West Baraboo. So one of these piers, uh, probably this one, this stone pier here is the stonework that you still see in the river today. This happened in 1890, 1890 in November when uh, shortly after 11 p.m. as a railroad uh, train was crossing the bridge, a hot box uh, jumped the tracks causing a uh, chain reaction that sent 24 cars into the river and of course as you can see demolishing the bridge. Miraculously no one was injured in the disaster although one of the brakemen was on the last car to remain on the bridge. A temporary bridge was built in 48 hours and much freight was salvaged from the wreck. But I rather imagine that some of this is still in the bottom of the river. <laughs> and again, uh, that right stone abutment can still be seen uh, in the river. Talk about floods uh, briefly. Of course, uh, all this uh, wonderful potential of the Bear River could also turn against us in the form of floods. Here's a picture of Rock Springs, Abelman from 1913. And you can imagine back then there was no flood insurance, no federal government to step in. Uh, you just dealt with it. Here's a great picture from Rock Springs from a later flood in the 30s, I believe. If you can read that sign, kind of ironic. <coughs> Another flood in the 30s in Rock Springs. Yeah. This is a view from Reedsburg, I think, from the uh, flood in the 1960s. And, of course, the big one was in 2008, which um, Lake Delton, of course, stole all the news, at least, at least initially, but um, uh, the flood came down. Of course, the Bearbo River affecting literally every community from Kendall all the way down to Baraboo in the highest recorded flood in some communities. There's Reedsburg. That's Rock Springs. Rock Springs. And here's the Manchester Street Bridge, just this barely survived being taken out. There's Circus World. <laughs> of course, many of the houses in the, in the floodplain in Rock Springs were finally bought out and demolished. On a happier note, we'll end with recreation on the Baraboo River, of course, as all of the dams have now been removed, all 11 of them from the Baraboo River. Somebody coined the phrase, and we'll use it until we're told not to, that the Baraboo River is the longest stretch of American River returned to free flowage. And uh, again, until somebody tells us otherwise, we're going to hang on to that. Um, so now it is, of course, used for recreation. It was a spot of some recreation. Of course, when the dams were in, there were lovely mill ponds of much stiller water and much deeper water. This is right here at uh, the Island Woolen Mill on that side of the um, uh, dam, a uh, lovely lagoon. Actually, this is the mill race between the dam and the mill over here 
and created a lovely little lagoon for paddling around. This is the bridge that eventually that went on to Island Court off of uh, Second Avenue here. <coughs> Another view, uh, this is in Reedsburg, um, fishing along the Baraboo River. And of course, ice skating here under the high bridge in Baraboo when the Oak Street Dam was in place and created one of the largest uh, mill ponds on the Baraboo River. Found this little uh, nugget. Uh, <coughs> This was a 1880 floating bathhouse that a man named Louis Mogler uh, set up. This would have literally been a barge that was small barge that was anchored into the river just below the Ash Walnut Street or the city bridge and would have uh, probably had an open spot in the middle of the barge with little cabanas, wooden cabins around it so you could change and then you could um, dip yourselves into that lovely untreated downstream from nine other communities <laughs> water <laughs> pre-sewer system great thing is there would have been some boards to kind of let the water through but let you stay uh, in the middle there so I don't think this lasted very long <laughs> for the use of all ladies and gentlemen early 1900s uh, Effinger uh, Ferdinand Effinger who ran the largest brewery uh, in Baraboo and Sauk County uh, created his own little pleasure uh, park along the Baraboo River on the model of the beer gardens in Milwaukee. Uh, this was um, on the lower Oxbow, so north of the Manchester Street Bridge would have been this footbridge, and his uh, park would have been there where, um, yeah, across from Spirit Point, west or east across from Spirit Point. Here's a picture of that. I believe this is. Manchester Street here, and Effinger would be over here. So he built a fence all the way around so nobody could sneak in or see what was going on. You had to pay your admission and cross that footbridge. He also um, purchased the old wooden Baraboo Depot from 1871, which is right here, hauled it all the way out there uh, for use as a dining hall, and built other buildings there. Uh, Spirit Point, which was just mentioned, of course, uh, never really built upon because it was too flood prone, but now a wonderful spot for um, the River Rendezvous. This is actually an earlier photo of the rendezvous when it was held here at Oxner Park. And of course, the River Walk is a great um, asset to Baraboo now, as well as uh, businesses that are starting to flourish along the Baraboo River. Talk a little bit about the rails to trails. Um, I must confess that in that bridge count, sometimes if there's two distinct bridges here in terms that one could be removed and there's still a bridge there, they were counted as two bridges at one crossing. But here we see the rail, the right, this of course was double tracked in 1896, so the right side bridge being used for the bike path and the other bridge uh, being left to sit there. <clears throat> there are some absolutely beautiful vistas and scenery on the bike trail, especially north of Laval up to uh, Elroy. Here's some of those views, and again, the river just kind of gets smaller and smaller, and yet it wiggles and crosses the railroad tracks almost 20 times, so they were constantly having to build uh, bridges. And lastly, of course, we're seeing the uh, development of the uh, river, it's always kind of been a recreational corridor, but even more so these days. And who knows, we might even have some whitewater kayak uh, certified rapids developed here in Baraboo. So that's our great uh, Baraboo River. Um, part of our, kind of a silent part of our lives sometimes until it uh, kind of acts up and floods onto our property and whatnot. But, um, has developed these 10 communities um, along the way.